Good evening, Hooper. Um, and good evening to the the listeners, everyone out there. It's uh, two seventy nine of our show, um, and it's Monday once again uh, in it the is. city, uh, the twenty third of November, uh, the last. No, not the last Monday, November, but the last, by the time it releases, this will be the last show of November. Yes. The last show of, uh, of, of NaNoWriMo, as the, as the yeah. writing community calls it. <laughs> um, have you been doing any writing during November? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah. No, but it's on my to-do list. You put, I am you put the be no at home. NaNoWriMo. <laughs> I, I put the no in November, my friend. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I've got some time on my hands here in the next few weeks, so hopefully I'll get some writing done. Yeah. That's the plan. Yeah. I got a little bit done. Uh, I have a, a project I'm working on that's, that is writing adjacent. It's got some writing to it, but I'm kind okay. of in like the early, like logging stages of it. So sure. I, it's, it's, it was writing, but it wasn't like sitting down and like spewing thoughts. It was like. Yeah. It was like, oh, this was when this it was more like it was more like a journal almost. Gotcha. Um Yeah, I did some some, you know, like beat sheet stuff and, you know, just like preliminary work, which is always the most time consuming, at least for me, where it's like I, I just need to figure out the structure of this thing and how I want it to flow and who these characters are and um and everything else kind of happens quickly ish. Yeah. Um, but it just seems like this first part just drags for me. Again, that's why my project was so easy because it's, 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 there's, there's other elements to it that are not writing that are just, mm. they're strangely similar to like my day job. So, so sure. I sort of have like a, pro- a process in place already for how I would tackle this right. part of sure. it. So, sure. um, it's very clinical so far. It's just, gotcha. it's simply just logging facts. Got so it. if, if it were a, if it were a book, you would call this like the research phase research. Sure. Right. So that's kind of where I'm at. It's, it's fairly rudimentary, but it's like, okay, that this is perfect. Cause it's not too much mental exercise, but it's enough. It's enough of this thing to kind of get me in like a, in like a rhythm to it a little bit. So I knocked out yeah. uh, some time. Uh, Cause I, I wake up, I wake up really early during the week. Mm-hmm. And so I finally got better at going to bed earlier during the week. Yeah. But like, what they tell you is okay. So on the week, because you know the whole thing about catching up on sleep, yeah, it's not a real thing. No, um, it's not. It's not. So like, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to keep as regular a schedule as possible. Yeah. I wake up at three in the morning, um, so I'm not going to do that on Saturday and Sunday. But I can't right. just sleep till even even with my kids, I still sleep until like seven. Sure, but that's still too much. So I was yeah. like, okay, what am I going to do? So yeah. I pretty much shifted that six hours I get like lop, lopsided a little bit to where I'm, I'm going to bed by like 11 and then I wake up at five Yeah, yeah and yeah. it's like, okay, so I get up at five, what do I do for two hours? And so right. it, that's when I do that is, is sure. that, that time. So yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to make it make sense. It's working. It's working. Okay. So far first weekend I tried, it was just this past weekend and sure. it, it went pretty well. So, okay. We'll see if we can keep that that one going. Every time I establish I, a routine, my children destroy it. <laughs> destroy it. <laughs> my my problem is I'm just I'm like Bruce Banner. Uh, m- my problem is that I'm always sleepy, and uh, so so there's like the, the idea of like oh a, a good schedule or oh going to bed on time like nothing works. I'm just always tired. Doesn't matter. That, that's that's exactly it's hard to wake up thing. every morning. Connor, how do yeah. you fall asleep within minutes? That's my secret. I'm That's always secret, sleepy. Captain. I'm always <laughs> sleepy. <laughs> and then like I do that turn and like my shirt rips off. And I'm just like oh. just in pajamas underneath. <laughs> 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 Suddenly you've got like one of those nightcaps Night on. Like. <laughs> A pillow just inflates next to my head. Yep. Oh. <laughs> and, and instead of like punching the Leviathan and growling, I like my head hits the pillow and I just go. <laughs> yeah it's not a roar it's a big yawn a big yawn all right well speaking of uh of nanowrimo and um writer writery things uh so months ago uh at some point um i talked about uh the prospect of what quentin tarantino was going to be doing after he stopped directing films he mm-hmm. has said you know i'm directing 10 
And then after that, I'm just going to like, I'm going to write books or I'm going to yeah. like exclusively write screenplays, but I won't be like directing movies anymore. I'm kind of, yeah, yeah. I've kind of reached my, my zenith there. Yep. Yep. Um, so uh, this is a follow up to that because this is just to remind everyone that that is indeed uh, what's going on with Quentin Tarantino. This is a story on deadline. All the stories are in the show notes, by the way, if you want to actually read them or if you hopefully you've already read them. Um, but you know, no judgment if you haven't. That'd be weird of me to hold that against you. <laughs> Quentin, Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> what a what a strange expectation to put on the list. Right. Well, hopefully you've read all of these already. <laughs> Such stupid idiot. What am? What is this a syllabus? <laughs> Summer reading. Participation is twenty percent of your grade. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, Quentin Tarantino has a setting a two book deal with Harper Collins. Uh, so that's already, you know, if, if you're an author, that's like, Oh, that's a, that's a sweet payday that's a good, there. It's a good deal. I know Harper Collins is, uh, the, 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 the real, the real McCoy as Bruce Nash would say. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> hmm. Um, once upon a time in Hollywood novelization is going to be one of them. And then another, this says this calls it a '70s movie deep dive called Cinema Speculation. So he's already got the books, you know, kind of. I, I'm assuming he's got them at least outlined. But I mean, Once Upon a Time in, Mex- in, in Mexico, <laughs> thinking mm. of Robert Rodriguez. <laughs> yep. Um. Uh. Because of his friendship with Quentin Tarantino, but Once Correct. Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, is getting a novelization. So maybe you think like, oh, what a cop out, you know, it, it's still a book that's written. It is different from the movie, if not just an expansion of it. And um, I don't know if you ever read any novel novelization of movies, Dustin, but I, I, I had the Spider-Man one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think I read the Superman Returns one. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day. I, and they're they're cool. I mean, if you've seen the movie, sure. it's it's a good companion. I mean, that's the whole point of this is it's a, it's a companion piece. And because he yep. he says that that's like what he grew up reading. That was like his. That was what does he say? I want to read exactly what he said about those. Um, he said that yeah, in the seventies, movie novelizations were the first adult books I grew up reading, and to mm-hmm. this day, I have a tremendous amount of affection for the genre. Um, so as a movie novelization aficionado, I'm proud to announce once upon a time in Hollywood, my contribution to this often marginalized yet beloved subgenre in literature. I'm also thrilled to further explore my characters and their world in a literary endeavor that can hopefully sit alongside its cinematic counterpart. Yeah. So it's like, Hey, if you love the movie, you should uh, yep. check out the book because there's more in it. And, um, the other is again, a, a deep dive into 70s cinema and, um, which is of course way up his alley. He, mm-hmm. Quentin Tarantino is a writer. It's not like he's a one trick pony. I mean, he, he, yeah. he loves writing. And if you've ever read anything about his writing process, like the, the old ass word processor he uses to, to write them. Um, yep. and I believe that when he starts writing, he, he writes everything in prose period. Mm-hmm. So if it, if it turns out to be something he wants to put into a movie, he's still like, okay, yeah. but I'm, I'm going to write the prose. That's just, that's, yep. that, that's his first draft process. Yep. And I remember when I learned that, that changed the way that I wanted to approach my own. Like, mm. you know, you, you have like a style and especially if you grew up like we did, like we were taught screenwriting and playwriting. Yep. We were not taught novelization. Right. Um, Correct. It, we were taught all about show, don't tell, externalize everything and yep. make sure you know the format and keep it, keep it bare because you know, we don't like to see a lot of prose and scene direction on the screen. People hate that. Yep. Yeah. But that's like the opposite of when you're writing a novel. So sure. it's like, well, what if you're writing a story and you don't know what it's supposed to be yet? And it wasn't until I read like Stephen King's book on writing and reading Quentin Tarantino's process of writing where it's like, oh, why don't you, why don't you just approach everything like prose? Because the great thing about prose is you don't have to worry right away about externalizing stuff. You can yeah. just say, all right, well, here's, here, okay, I already know what the character is thinking and feeling. Let's just do the thinking and feeling part. And then later, if mm-hmm. I decide this should be a screenplay, well, I'll go through and make sure none of that stuff is, you know, in, in here. I'll make sure it's all external. Yeah. But then if it's way better as a novel, I'll just turn it into a book. And that's mm-hmm. what Tarantino does and pretty much said, I'm just going to do that after I'm done uh, directing yeah. films. So uh, he wasn't kidding. He's got a book deal, a double, a two book deal. And um, wow. it's going to sell a buttload of copies and, yes, uh, and carry him uh, further into his retirement as an artist. Good for him. I know. It's amazing. I, I'm yeah. not like the guy needs any more money, but like, I'm just, yeah. I'm just happy that 
I, I guess I like it when, when, when creative people can just go, I mean, like Gene Hackman retired from acting in like the mid two thousands and he's been writing, yeah. he's been writing novels for like 15 years. Yeah. Right. And like not, not a lot of people know that. Right. I'm sure right. a lot of people listening were like, Oh, that's right. Gene Hackman. I remember that guy. Right. Yep. I know. Right. Where'd he yeah. go? He's been writing. Yeah. He's been fine. He's been hanging out. Selling yeah. books. Yeah. 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 I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy that's happening. And of course I'm interested and, and, the dude's never going to run out of ideas. He's just, he just, no. he'll just write it and go, cool. I don't have to do anything else. I, I wrote the story. That's it. I wrote it and it's done. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it's such a natural thing, uh, especially for people involved in the film industry, because we're all in it for storytelling. Yeah. Um, from, from, you know, the, the lowliest PA to the highest, uh, director, um, everybody's in it for storytelling and, or should be. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, an easy transition to understand where somebody would say, Hey, I'm a director, but I'm now going to write books or I'm an actor. And now I'm going to write books. And that makes complete sense because it's, it's scratching that itch that you always have had, um, just in a different way. And maybe in a more solitary, singular auteur ish way, you get to, you get to tell your story presumably without limitation. And that's what, you know, when you're talking about the novelizations that, the reason I got the Superman Returns novelization back in 06 or whenever that film came out was uh, it, it promised additional content that the film didn't have. You know, there was that whole sequence at the beginning. I don't know if anybody remembers Superman Returns. I, I certainly have a vague memory of it, and I'm a huge Superman fan. But there's like that whole sequence where Clark, it, it like comes back to earth. Like the whole film starts with him coming back to earth and it's like, Oh, he's been in space for X amount of years trying to find Krypton or whatever. And they just like gloss over it with like text on the screen, like Superman left. Now he returns. <laughs> and like, that's it. And, and like the book gave all of that information that the movie didn't get. Right. And, and evidently it was all written. Right. And I think even Brian Singer filmed some of it. Really? It's just, it, he just cut it all out. I guess he figured it would just, it's easier just to put text on the screen than finish these VFX. It's crazy that like the amount of money, I mean, you already hear about like productions where it's like, you know, we're, yeah. we're spending too much money or we need to save money. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, but you'll shoot like weeks of footage that you don't end up using Yes. I don't know whose fault that is, but I think David Fincher was saying it's like four hundred thousand dollars a day. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah, and that's the thing. <laughs> I, I remember, I remember at one point somebody had calculated what Brian Singer likely spent on that. That it was like a thirty-minute opening sequence of Clark or Kal El, Superman, whatever you want to call him, exploring space, and it was all cut, every single bit of it. And it's like so much money wasted. If he had just cut it before he started filming, the film would have had a drastically smaller budget and probably would have turned a profit. <laughs> I think it did, but it was still just a mild success. Could have made you know a what I mean? Bigger profit. It would have made a bigger profit. Yeah. Ah. Anyway, <laughs> and then maybe we wouldn't have the Zack Snyder abominations. But oh well. Another. Sure. Another rant for another day. Sure. Exactly. You're not contractually allowed to say abomination though when you're talking about DC. No, sorry. Even I'll, I'll, resist I'll the call temptation. It doomsday. I'll call it doomsday. <laughs> <laughs> Mother. There, there probably is a DC character called Abomination. There, there's such an overlap, and that's such a common. I'm looking it up right now. Are you really? <laughs> I'm sure it's somewhere. Why isn't this loading? Uh, nothing. Uh, there may not be. Okay. Oh well. I was gonna say that would be that would be a hefty lawsuit, wouldn't it? I don't know. Abomination is, I, I don't know if that's a trademarkable term, but maybe it is. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know if they really want, um, I have to select the whole stupid link just to open it on my phone. I got to find a better way to do this than opening links on my phone. Yeah. I would, I would, I would think that, uh, I would think that they couldn't do that. I guess it depends on which character was yeah. licensed or, uh, or sure. created first. Sure. Um, Okay. Well, considering that the Wi-Fi is not going to let me open this article without um, putting half the thing in white. Here we go. I got another um, tidbit of uh, entertainment news concerning uh, people, at least that I um, associate my attention to. Such a weird way to say that. On um, uh -huh. Variety, Conan O'Brien is ending the TBS uh, show. Um, yeah. The, his, his late night show, Conan... I'm just going to have to hold the phone over here, Dustin. That feedback is gotcha. strong. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, ending his late night show in 2021 and is going to have a weekly series, a variety series on HBO mm-hmm. Max. Yeah. He's coming home to Dustin. Yes. Um, strange way to say that too. Um, right. Um, self in, in, in ending uh, Conan in June 2021. Uh, that's the announcement by Warner Media. Um, forget it, man. How can I? I'll just read it this way. Hello. Um, <laughs> Hello. I can't win, Dustin. This won't let me. <laughs> How far can I hold my phone further? I'm, I'm not hearing it right now. Social distance from my phone. Right. <laughs> um, the, the, the announcement marks the end to an 11 year run. I didn't realize it had been that long. Yeah, man. 11 years. 11 years. That's a long run for just a late night show, but consider how many different times he's he's jumped to a new yep. thing. Yep. Um, 11-year run on TBS. His travel specials, Conan Without Borders, will continue to air on TBS going forward. In addition, O'Brien has signed a deal with HBO Max for a new weekly variety series, though no premiere date has been set for that series. Why would that be? Why would it be set? Yeah. It's like yeah. several months. Anyway. Um, right. With the announcement, Full Frontal with Samantha B will be the sole late night show on TBS, renewed for a fifth season last year. <laughs> this, the, I, I like Conan's statement. I don't know if you read it or not. I didn't. The, I read it. Here's his quote. Uh, In 1993, Johnny Carson gave me the best advice of my career. As soon as possible, get on a streaming platform. I'm thrilled <laughs> that I get to continue doing whatever the hell it is I do on HBO Max, and I look forward to a free subscription. <laughs> 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 um... This says O'Brien famously came to TBS in 2010 from NBC. There he had hosted Late Night with Conan O'Brien for over 15 years before he was tapped to take over The Tonight Show from Jay Leno. However, after NBC attempted to move the primetime series, The Jay Leno Show, to Late Night and push back The Tonight Show to the 12.05 a.m. time slot, O'Brien quit the show rather than, quote, participate in what I honestly believe is its destruction. Mm. Um, anyway, so... Um, Pretty much TBS is like, hey, it's a great run, you know, looking forward to, you know, whatever else yeah. and blah, blah, blah. So it it seems amicable. It just seems. And again, yeah. like Conan, uh, this article doesn't really mention that, but th- they made the decision, what, one or two years ago to change the entire format? Yeah. Uh, to go from hour long to half hour? To half hour. And it, what did he say at the time? It just, it just needed, the, the hour long format was becoming exhaustive and he thought that yeah. it was... Pretty much, he'd say we've done enough experimenting with like with with guest guest centered uh, and, mm-hmm. and and comedy centered content that where we don't have to fit a one hour construct anymore. Yeah, a, a, and also maybe it'll help our ratings. I don't right, know. What sure. was the story with that? So Conan's always been like this this guy that likes to push the envelope and and not just in his comedy but just in the way he delivers things. And so so you have if you want to just jump into Conan right on TBS, it started fairly straightforward. It's like all the other late night shows. And then, and then suddenly like Conan decides he's going to do the podcast and he's going to, um, embrace this half hour format. That's more casual where he doesn't have to wear a, a suit and tie every night. And, so um, wear a leather and jacket. Yeah. A leather jacket and like a checkered shirt and, um, and, and, and blue jeans. And, and that's, great like that that's him being conan and he's he's always been the king of those remotes where he goes on location in different places with different people and he's just always been sort of a a pioneer in how can i get out of the studio how can i break the format a little bit and and i super respect that about him he's probably still my favorite late night talk show host and and so this doesn't really strike me as being surprising considering he's done these like Conan on the road things for the last little bit where he'll go to a specific place like Japan and he does like a week in Japan and he'll do a week over here and he just does like all of these little things and sort of releases them as like a, a one week kind of mini travel log. And um, he's always been that guy that's trying to do something new and fresh and cool. And so this does not surprise me at all. And I think in fact, if it frees him up, I think this is the move because Conan, um, I think thrives when, when he doesn't have as many limitations. Um, and that's not to say that he also can't perform when there are limitations, but you know, if you think about like that, that brief time between, the the NBC era and the TBS, TBS era, yeah. he goes on on like a he he takes 
a, a, a does a tour of this like one man show kind of a thing that's really not a one man show. It's like this is me and all my friends doing what we're supposed to be doing. Just right. NBC won't let us, and and it was phenomenal. I don't know if you, there's a documentary it's called Conan O'Brien Can't Stop, right? Conan O'Brien Can't Stop. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. And, uh, and the show looked like so much fun and it's just him doing all kinds of goofy things. And that's what this sounds like. That's when he grew his and beard so, out and like, yeah. yeah, it's like peak era Conan. Yeah. And, it was uh, peak, it, peak crazy cut. Like I was, he was so unpredictable. I was like, what's he going to do? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all for this. I think that's cool. And obviously, you know, I'm a HBO max shill already. So I'm, I'm on, I'm on board. Well, and this is part of those things that will get people subscribing to stuff like that. There was there's yeah. versions of this, like I mean, John Oliver's show on 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 um I, I guess it's on HBO Max. I mean, like it it's that's a reason to to for people to subscribe. Um, that's sure. that's a strong show. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was even I think it got canceled, but for a while there was the Joel McHale show on Netflix. Yes. Uh, yeah. Did that get canceled? I've not seen that anywhere. I haven't seen it in a while. Ooh. Yeah. That's and then, uh, and then David Letterman's on Netflix that's now. That's true, but I don't yeah. see that's. <clears throat> I feel like this is the biggest get so far. I love Joel McHale. I, yeah, I, I've never. I, I'm too young to be. It, is it? I hope it's understandable to anybody listening. I'm 31 years old. I have zero attachment to Dave Letterman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just doesn't. It makes. I think Conan and probably like Jimmy Kimmel is like our generations. Uh, late night people, would you say? Who would you say? I, that I would is? agree. My, my dad loves David Letterman, right? Like, right. That was that was his guy, and Jeez, so I don't know if my dad loves any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and Conan is mine, right? Yeah, like yeah. Conan. Like I remember my dad talking about David Letterman being a genius, and yeah, and Conan Kim was is a little too a little older than us too. He was a little bit before our time, or after what? Well, yeah. He I, okay. started after Conan. He did, um, but like he, so he, he's probably he, closer to. He hit big um, when like Lost was getting started, like when ABC yes. was really surging as like a, a strong provider of like premium primetime content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My thing, my thing with Kimmel, and I mean this is this is purely opinion. Yeah. Um, my thing with Kimmel is I don't I don't find him as um, I don't find I, like. I love Conan's energy and I love the the wackiness of it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Kimmel's always been in the safe zone mm. and 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 does, you know, his interviews and and he he's a great host in that way. Yeah. But I don't remember like his little games that he plays or like remotes. I don't remember any remotes, like nothing sticks with me, but Conan, there's like so much content in my brain, like forever, whether it's Mr. T going apple picking or like, <laughs> like, like Conan with Jordan Schlansky on any trip ever. Like all yeah. of these moments are just stuck in my brain. And that's like, that's pure Conan. It, it's great when they send him out to like the American girl store, right? Like <laughs> it, it's totally something that he can't do or relate to. Right. But like, here comes this like towering orange <laughs> hair haired man into the American girl doll store. I and it's like inherently one of the things that's cool about sending Conan to like French Guyana or some weird, <laughs> right. some weird country. Like he's just this super noticeable it's like six yes. foot five redheaded. Yes. Sore thumb of a man. <laughs> He's a human sore thumb. <laughs> he is. And, uh, and, and yeah, man, but that's that like, so in, in my head, like Conan is, is my guy. Yeah. And plus like I have the, the podcast to listen to and, and all of right. this, you know, incredible comedy that he's done that, um, I don't know. It just, it speaks to me. I guess my sensibilities are, are more wacky and, and I'm not going to say like Jimmy Kimmel plays it safe necessarily, but I will say he's more of a traditional, like I'm going to interview you and I'll find the comedy in the interview as opposed to like, I am my own brand of comedy and, and Conan, like you can very clearly spell out like his comedy is, you know, this self depreciating, like, yeah you know, wacky, whatever. And, and, and I can't say the same thing about Kimmel, although I also haven't seen a lot of Kimmel. I've seen, I've seen yeah. a fair amount, but not a lot. Boy, we could do an entire episode, like, you know, sort of comparing and contrasting the current late night 
yeah. hosts, which yeah. of them I can even remember, you know, I mean, right. Uh, there's, there's, there's too many, there's, there's, there's Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, James Corden, t- t- yeah. Seth Myers, Samantha B, yeah. uh, a couple other people. I don't know, you know? Yeah. And then like, do, you know, people who have like internet shows and then like other people, like new people. Uh, I, I don't know. It's crazy, but like, Hey, sp- before we, before we jump out, out of this subject, I'll probably yeah. review this, um, eventually, but, um, I started watching the Animaniacs reboot on Hulu Yeah, and, and there's an episode where pinky and the brain are trying to take over the world, obviously. And they decide like brain needs to go on the Seth Meyers show and they specifically say, I've got to go on, like, I'm going to go on Seth Meyers. And they've, like, animated Seth Meyers and everything. And I don't think he actually provides the voice. I think it's somebody doing an impression. But, like, he's holding a I wonder a if it's Josh mug. Myers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> he's holding, like, this mug that says smug. And, uh, and like, the whole thing is so, like, smarmy and gross. And it's it's just hilarious that they're making fun of this guy on <laughs> Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe they took the time to animate jokes at my expense. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's what would be the most <laughs> insulting to me. Like, not only am I the subject of ridicule, like... It Somebody took, animated this for yeah, eight months. This went through several... <laughs> yeah, this went through almost a year of revisions. Like, I don't know. While they're making fun of his appearance, we really need these shadows to match with the light. So, right, exactly. <laughs> you had several multiple opportunities to not do this yes. to me <laughs> you chose yep, exactly. to keep going exactly and call yeah. me by name yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah wow who who who's who owns <sighs> seth Meyers. i'm trying to think seth Meyers on cbs isn't he um i guess you I don't, don't even know I guess you don't have to work for the same company as the person you're making fun of do you <laughs> no but it does help in terms of licensing if you need if you need that sort of thing oh well but i guess if it's parody you don't yeah yeah, that opens up a lot of possibilities for me. Yeah, it does. <laughs> somehow, <laughs> right? Sure. Down the road. Um, right. uh, okay, I I gotta ask you. Whew, all right, I wonder if there's a way we can briefly address this gigantic subject. Um, <laughs> 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 let's start with uh, with the headline. Did you hear about this? Uh, uh, Universal and Cinemark strike historic deals, uh, shrinking the theatrical window for event pictures to 31 days. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole link in the show notes on the show notes in the show notes from the Hollywood Reporter about this. And then there's this uh, website uh, that has a uh, kind of a breakdown of what it really means. That website is mm-hmm. my darling IndieWire. <laughs> um <laughs> Is this Zach Scharf? No, it's Tom Brueggemann. Br- 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 Two D's, two N's. Brueggemann. You almost said that like it was a late night show. Brueggemann. Tom Brueggemann. Bruce Nash. So this, the headline is this on IndieWire. It's very, pretty much tells you where they stand on it. Universal's Cinemark deal is exhibition's future. Studios set rules, theaters follow. And uh, it's it's just to, to quickly summarize what's, uh, what the deal actually was. Well, there goes the Wi-Fi again, so maybe not. Um, pretty much like everything else in the pandemic, we've got an existing problem that uh, was headed this way and, you know, just got there faster. And this is sort of another thing that's, you know, happening to, to the theater exhibitors, um, shortening the theatrical window from God, it used to be like 70 something. I mean, it used to be obviously, you know, when we talk about used to be, it depends on what year you're talking about. I mean, it used to be super long. It used to be like a year or something crazy, but like now it's like three, two and a half months. Yeah. Um, and there was this pressure, from studios to be able to get them out of exhibition so that they could get them onto rental and home distribution faster because DVDs is where they make their money. So it's like, okay, once we get through that surge, it's costing us money in like week 10 to keep exhibiting the film. And we're making like $6,000 a weekend. So this is silly. Um, How can we, yeah. How can we, you know, there's, there's, there's a big juicy front end where we're making money. And then it's like this horrible end where we're just spending more than we're making to keep it in theaters. 
mm-hmm. and we could be putting it on Blu-ray and selling it and making money. And then in like the mid two thousands or the 2010, I guess we'll call it when like digital media or sorry, uh, uh, physical media ceased to like be worth anything. When, yeah. when streaming started that collapsed, that changed the way films were made, everything. That's a whole big domino effect. You can read about it in lots of other places. Um, but, uh, so one of the things that that did was it shrank the theatrical window even more instead yeah. of get these films out of theaters so we can sell them to home markets. It was, we need to be able to license them out to streaming services and make money that way. Um, and then it became, we need to be able to, we need the freedom to put them on our own streaming services that we've created. If, if we're high, we're Disney or we're Warner brothers. Right. Um, and now it's, um, Hey, um, we can put these on our streaming services whenever we want, but yeah. we'd love to not split people's attention. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, so this deal, again, this isn't loading, so whatever, but it, it, it pretty much was a deal between Universal Studios and, and, and Cinemark's uh, theaters yep. to shorten that to 31 days. And it's even shorter depending on um, the gross. Um, right. Pretty much. So I be- yeah. Do you yeah I the- believe the number is like 50 million. If it, if it, if, <clears throat> If it reaches fifty million within its first weekend, I think then it then it's free to. It may not be the first weekend. Anyway, it, there's a fifty million dollar mark that it has to hit, and then within thirty one days they can release it for streaming wherever. Let me see. Here's the. Um, let's see with AMC. Uh, Universal negotiated the option to place releases on PVOD after the third weekend of release. Now Universal has a deal with Cinemark that adds a new wrinkle. The PVOD option extends to five weeks if the film opens to more than $50 million. Uh, Technically, it's not set in stone. Um, uh, Uh, The two extra weeks are a Cinemark victory, but in 2019, only 16 films cleared that $50 million bar. There were 13 other films that made over $100 million, but opened to less than $50 million. Uh, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Knives Out, Hustlers, 1917, the 90-day window for standard price v, uh, standard price VOD and hard copy ownership and rentals remains. So uh, what's, it goes on to say, um, we don't know when or if theaters will provide that level of gross again. Studios can easily reduce opening gross by limiting the number of theaters that open a film or limiting the number of screens they play in each theater, they could shift marketing to other platforms, which might reduce initial interest and bolster later revenues. Uh, it says, for instance, studios see an 80% return from PVOD and between 55 and 60% for theatrical, uh, whatever the strategy is in the studio's hands. So it's a it's an interesting just sort of development, like more pieces of news that solidify this yep. new relationship between studios and exhibitors and it's it's for if, if you thought that maybe this the theaters were going to find a way to get the upper hand yep this was like a giant punch in the junk right but see so this this is exactly what you and i have, have mentioned before which is when we when when a studio releases a film on on streaming like let's say you know for instance warner brothers announced they're doing this for wonder woman 1984 mm-hmm. released uh, Christmas Day this year. Same with Disney Pixar's Soul, right? That's going to Disney Plus on the same day. Right, um, for free. So for free. Sa- same with Wonder Woman. It's for free. Wow. And so and so when they do this, the question is, how do they make money? Mm-hmm. The only way that they would conceivably make money is if new subscribers log on for the first time because of that film. Right. Um, but the the numerical data behind that, I haven't seen. I don't know how often that happens and really if that's even profitable at all, because you would assume that most people who are going to be wanting to see soul already yeah. have Disney plus. So there's no reason for, for them to spend any money. Right. right? right. So releasing it for free makes no sense. No. Um, that's, that's sort of the reason why Mulan as frustrating as it was at least made financial sense. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, for them. 
And so, and so it's, it's weird, but this makes sense, right? That the theater or that the, the studios would understand, or at least begin to understand now that the theater system actually is important because that is where they're going to make the most money. And especially their opening weekends, like those things have been incredibly lucrative for the MCU, for these big superhero films and for movies like soul, even opening weekend is big. And so, and so for them to be able, able to strike some deal um, universal here where they are able to still have that opening weekend in theaters and then shift to another model it makes complete and total sense to me because for them they're getting the best of both worlds they are now able to um, essentially get exactly what they've always gotten out of theaters although you know right now things are limited but but presumably in a year or two we're back at full swing and everything's great and dandy and these movies are opening as big as they once were yeah. and so they're getting that great you know that great huge money injection at that point but then they're also getting the option to one month later have it on video on demand and this this could be i don't i'm, I'm not sure how it breaks down if, if they're considering video on demand uh pvod or just like a streaming thing or if there is any delineation between it um but the point is for them to be able to diversify the way that that film sees people um that is super smart and and actually, even though this doesn't actually benefit the theaters, in a way it does. Because right. in a way, exhibitors now understand that the studios have at least somewhat acknowledged that the theatrical window is important in some way. Yeah. And and that and that at least even if even if eventually it shrinks to like we're going to release Wonder Woman three for one week only in right. theaters and then it goes straight to streaming after right. that like if that's the way that this goes then the theater owners still get the satisfaction of knowing like you can't get rid of us like right they, they, you have to have us they have validated them they, they may have yeah. they've sort of, sort of said like it's a weird like backhanded compliment like you are essential to our business model. Yeah. Even if it's only for two or three weeks, it's still like you're 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 more useful to us in concentrated doses because yeah. you can pull in more money. Like I, I, I my reaction to this was this is still overall good for, for the consumer because it, it is, yeah. you know, which is the biggest thing. It's like I'm worried about how it affects the whole the studios only in as much as I want them to make money doing this because I don't want them to raise their prices because I don't like that. And I want, so I want the, the business model to work so that they don't have to do something I hate to make themselves whole. Yeah. As a consumer. And options are good. For, for, for options the consumer, are good. options are good. <laughs> exactly. And so if I, if I can go to the theaters, great. If, yeah. if I'm going to wait, great. Like I can do either yeah. way. This to me, it, it's, this to me is, is, I don't want to speak too soon, but to me, this is the ideal situation like for, with yeah. movies like, okay, um, whatever it's, 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 it's May, 2024. Uh, and I, I keep using secret wars as like the hypothetical big event movie that's you know sure. mar- for Marvel. Okay. So secret wars is coming out. All right. So secret wars is going to be in wide release on May 3rd, 2023. And, um, and, or you can watch it on Disney plus, um, for 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 a premium, you know, for a premium yeah, for fee, 30 bucks. Um, yeah. on June first or June third, yeah. okay, yeah, and then you can yeah. see it for free in July on July third on Disney Plus. Yep. So, people who really can't afford to go to theaters, at least they can yeah. see the film in July rather than August yeah. or September after right. purchasing it or renting right. it. Right. People who have Disney Plus and they want to pay the premium, okay, cool. So they they might still save money or they can't get their kids, whatever. Okay, they still get to see it after four weeks. Yeah. People like me who cannot wait to see the film and will not wait to see the film will pay yeah. money for a ticket to yep. go to a theater and see, and it. see it immediately. Yep. Or I don't have to see it right away, but I want to enjoy it with an audience. I'm yep. going to the theater for that. That's like it's the yep. same thing as a football game. Do you want to see the football yeah. game with a crowd or do you want to watch it on TV? Fine. Right. If you won't, if you don't care about going, watch yeah. it on television yeah. and have right. some ads shot at your eyeballs, and they'll make money right. from you that way. Right. You can avoid the ads, pay ninety seven thousand dollars for a ticket, <laughs> right? And, and right. go to the football game, but you might have more fun, and it's it's your thing. Yeah. So to me, this is great because it creates a sense of urgency. Like if yeah. you want to see some theaters, 
then plan it. Then then you've got yeah. four weeks to do it. Pick a weekend yeah. and come yeah. out here and see us because we're we're gonna try and shove all you guys into this first three or four weeks here. Yep. And then the movie's gonna be gone. And if so, if, if it matters to you to see this in theaters, get your ass out here and see it in theaters. And if it doesn't, yeah. stay your ass home and maybe it won't make any money and it'll come to you sooner. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and what what is it per month for Disney Plus? Like seven seven, seven dollars. Yeah. Okay. So so seven dollars. Like I could see it breaking down this way. Okay, go to the theaters, spend mm-hmm. your fifteen dollars per person to see Secret Wars. Yeah. Then a month later, you can pay a, a premium of thirty dollars on Disney Plus, just like Mulan, to be able to watch Secret Wars. Great. Mm-hmm. Then a month later, it's it's free. It's it's on Disney Plus. But for those people who do not yet have Disney Plus, if they put it behind like a trial blocker right so like i can't sign up for a seven day trial and watch it for free right but rather like if i pay that seven dollars for that first month Mm -hmm. then i have access to it and and so then all of a sudden and then maybe another three months later then they take it out from behind that trial paywall Mm -hmm. right so then all of a sudden like there's essentially four options to the consumer based on how important it is to you to see it yeah it's super important I'm going to pay the $50 per person right. to go see it, right? So for a family of four, yeah, I'm going to be paying that that 60 bucks, yeah. right? But Or I'll wait a month and pay 30 for the family of four, or I'll wait a month and pay another month and pay $7, or I'll wait another three and not pay at all. And, and all along that spectrum, Disney makes money, and then – you even consider that one behind the paywall or outside of the trial paywall where like I didn't pay anything and I got to see secret wars. I just saw it five months after everybody else. Um, those people, well, guess what? They forget to cancel that subscription and Disney gets their money anyway. <laughs> right. And so like there's, and that, and that will happen. And so Disney's making money, you know, from this one film for months and months and months, right. as opposed to the the model right now, which is, it's in theaters for however long it plays two months, you know, being about the tops, I guess. And then, and, and it, and it plays and then it's just gone. It's like right. nowhere for a little while and Disney's just sitting on it. And then it's released on Blu-ray and then it's on Disney plus and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. so, but, but they're not really making money on it much at that point. And so, and so the great thing is with that current idea that, that you and I just laid out with, you know, month by month by month, yeah. at some point that is released on Blu-ray too. And the people who saw it in theaters in in that first, you know, that opening weekend, like three months later, well, those people are probably going to buy it on Blu-ray too. Right. Right. And so you get that money doubled up. Right. Right. And so anyway, it's, it, yeah, it's great. Yeah. It just creates- or, or it's doubled up anyway, because I paid opening weekend and I saw it. Mm-hmm. And then a month later, I want to see it again. I'm right. going to do that from home though. Right. So I'm going to pay that $30 premium. Right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Like, like, especially a lot of these things, like you'll, you'll, you'll sampled multiple experiences. You want to see it immediately. Yeah. So I think I probably talked about this in one of the solo episodes. I, the solo episodes I did is you you want to see it immediately. And then, you know, you'll give it a second watch from the comfort of your own home, depending on if it's a, still a premium price or it's for, or it's free at that point for you. Um, there's, there's more ways to see the movie in more ways that you are most comfortable seeing it. And each of them costs something um, it just, it's a cost, cost benefit, you know? Yep. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it's overall a good thing. It's being couched as a bad thing to an extent. Um, but I think that it's reassuring if anything of the business model and, um, mm. gives the consumer more choice, which is the goal. Yep. yep. Okay, yep. cool. That didn't take long. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to go to break and, uh, when we come back from the break, We're going to talk about The Invisible Man, and we're also going to talk about something else that Dustin wants to talk about. Yeah. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. You can solve it if you you know, uh, if you read the show notes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'll uh, be right back on the Hoopercast Movie Hour. (laughs) 